I'd like you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Galatians in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, keep on going, keep on going. Eventually you'll make your way past 1st and 2nd Corinthians and you're going to end up by a faith that you can do this. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. This is uh, part two of You Can Have a Comeback. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16. Paul wrote, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. These are contrary to one another, so that You do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Verse 24. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Verse 25, if we walk in the Spirit, let us also, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. What's very clear from this portion of Scripture, the writings of Paul, is that if you want love and peace and joy and gentleness, you're going to have to fight for it. It's not an automatic. It's not by default. It's not just going to happen. Paul says that there's this constant, fierce, intense, very personalized war, conflict, raging and waging in everyone's in the domain of your heart. And it's a fight between the passions of the flesh and the desires of the Spirit. How many believe the Holy Spirit has some desires? And your flesh has desires. And these are constantly on collision course. And according to Paul, you have to make an intelligent unwavering decision of which spirit and desires you're going to give in to. In other words, Paul is saying you can't walk in the spirit and still serve yourself. Self has got to go. Look to your neighbor and say, self has got to go. And so Paul says that there is this battle between the spirit and and self, the two S's, spirit, Holy Spirit, and self. And he says these are diametrically opposed so that you can even have a desire to do what's right, but you're not going to do it. You're going to fall short unless you have yielded completely to the control and the dominion and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so there are two groups of people here today. Those who are walking in their flesh and those who are walking in the spirit. You say, Mark, how would I know which one I'm walking in? If you're wondering which one you're walking in, you're probably not walking in the Spirit. Because if you're walking in the Spirit, you're going to know. that. How many agree? you got to know you're walking in the Spirit. It's not that you say, I've arrived, I'm perfect. But you should know that you've surrendered fully to the guidance and direction, the influence of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul says here, you want love, you want peace, you want joy, you can have it, but you got to put to death the flesh, you got to be crucified with Christ. We all want Jesus, 
But when Jesus says, you can't have me unless you have me fully. You can't follow me unless you repent and make a total turnaround, and I'll help you to do that. Because the Bible says, Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing, John 15, verse 5. So you cannot even do something before you come to God. But when you come to God, you cannot leave your chamber of prayer until you've made up your mind resolutely, unequivocally. I've made up my mind. See, the devil gets nervous when we make up our mind. I made up my mind. I will no longer live for myself. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. Flesh will not rule in my life anymore, so help me Jesus. Can you say amen to that? I met Shirley on a dance floor, and it was surely a mistake. (laughs) (laughs) And I was a high school dropout. After ninth grade, I dropped out of school. All I could care about is parties and my friends and and smoking and drinking and drugs and uh, being a late blooming hippie. All I could think about was cruising around and and yeah, I was a shipper and receiver in a printing envelope company and about the only thing I had to show for a meager paycheck was my 1966 satellite convertible, my pride and my joy. I had it jacked up, big tires in the back and at times I just had bald tires in the front. And being a foolish young man, I remember going 120 miles per hour. Don't try this. 120 miles per hour with my nice slick tires that I could peel out on the back with bald tires. You could see the bare threads on the front of it. Can you say foolish? These are the deeds of the flesh. And I remember, I remember being in the car with my buddy Paul in his... Uh, GTO, how many remember goats in his GTO? And I remember we were going out in a portion of highway in Hartford, Connecticut, and he wanted to kind of test the maximum of the goat that he had there. And uh, all I can say is he was going 80, then 90, then 100, and the car's starting a little, you know, uh, jostle about a little bit, kind of quiver a little bit. At about 140, that thing is shaking, and I'm wondering, you know, who's shaking more, the car or me? And, uh, and as I look back, it's like, did I really go through that? And then another evening, <clears throat> I'll get back to Shirley in a moment, we'll leave her on the dance floor for a second, but at any rate... All I know is on another occasion, my buddy Paul and another buddy were in the front seat of a big a Mercury. It was like a tank. I mean, remember these mega tanks? They don't make cars like that anymore. It's like double car. And uh, at any rate, there's this Mercury, and we were in it in the back seat, and he had that thing jacked up as well. It wasn't worth jacking up. But at any rate, all I know is, is we were going very, very fast, an unreasonable speed, once again there in Hartford, Connecticut area. And I remember we were passing cars like they were standing still. And all of a sudden, I noticed he, what, this guy, this friend of Paul, Paul, Paul's friend and my friend, I noticed he wasn't slowing up. We were coming to a curve, and he wasn't slowing up. I'm like, what is he thinking? And we were under, under the influence. But anyway, here we were going along. And he lost control, completely spun around, spun around, smashed into the guardrail, spun around right after we finished passing cars. And I turned around, and somehow those cars maneuvered around us. And then he put it into gear once again, smashed up a little bit, and took off. As I look back at those harrowing experiences, I think to myself, where was I? When you're walking in the flesh, your flesh will surprise you just how much it'll take of you. As I look back, I also see a God who is very patient with every one of us. I met Shirley on the dance floor. And uh, this was also another different kind of reckless mistake. We moved in together. 
And uh, my parents were chagrined at that, but they knew I was been on drugs. I was an alcoholic, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. I was the pastor's prodigal son who really didn't want to come home, so to speak. And so we moved in together. We talked about getting married. I knew it was wrong. I'd been raised that these things were wrong, but I really didn't care. And so we started talking about getting married and so forth. And as we continued in our relationship, I could see that it really wasn't even. It really wasn't uh, equitable. It really wasn't on the same page, the same level. It seemed that I was more committed to her, which was a new thing for me. Uh, but um, I, I, I felt that I was more solidly committed to the relationship more than she was. And so that made me feel insecure. And so I thought, well, I'll just uh, turn up the charm, you know, and uh, turn up my good looks and uh, do whatever I can do to kind of win her over. Even though we're living together and talking about uh, getting married, still I felt like I needed to win her over because she didn't sign the dotted line yet about getting married. So at any rate, I remember, you know what? I think I need to quit smoking and quit drinking. Not for God. No, I, it wasn't in my life. I thought, let me quit smoking and drinking and drugs for the relationship. She did not request it. She didn't ask for it. But I thought one of the benefits of that, one of the fringe benefits will be I'll probably have better control over my tongue of what I say. So I quit smoking, quit drinking, quit drugs. It was just the power of the will. But I believe God was working even though I didn't recognize it on the, at the time. And so... One week after I quit drinking and quit drugs and smoking, I did it all in one package, all of a sudden, the weekend came and surely took off for the weekend. And I was left alone in the apartment, and I knew what she was doing. She was just feeling like she just had to see and time to think. Whenever you hear that, you know it's really dangerous. Time to think. And so she went with an old boyfriend for the weekend. I was devastated. Absolutely devastated. It's called humble pie. And, you know, I know male ego is a pretty formidable thing at times, but it was more than that. I was hurt. I was crushed. I was devastated. And so I was not about to, to, to just be there stewing over my problem and my hurt, my trouble, my pain. And so I called up my buddies and sure enough, we went out, you know, and just resumed the drink and the smoke and the drugs and everything. And then, and then after parting with them, I came back to my empty, well, she wasn't there. So in my mind, it was empty right there to be confronted with my loneliness again, went to sleep somehow woke up in the morning and now I had two problems. She was still gone and I was sick to my stomach. And the ceiling spinning around. I was making these trips to the restroom and I'm trying to blast my rock and roll leads up and whatever, trying to, trying to clear my mind, trying to medicate my pain. And nothing could drown it out. And I remember thinking to myself, as I kept looking out the window to see if I would see the car, the blue maverick. <laughs> I just remember feeling the pain. And I said to myself, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I made a decision on that day, alone in my hurt, no more drinking, no more drugs, no more smoking. And to this day, I have not touched it ever since. I didn't give my heart to God. But as I look back, that was God. Don't tell me you can't quit a habit cold turkey. I quit three habits like that. I believe when you have the power of the will to do something right, even though you may not recognize it, God's power is there, wind in your sails, so that when you look back, you realize that was a God thing. She came back, 
and it was a soap opera. I won't bore you with the details, but there was a lot of tears, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, yeah, right. <laughs> and, you know, we tried to patch things up and so forth. Oh, surely, you know, I forgive you, and in my heart, I'm thinking, I'll never trust you again. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, well, you know, self-destructive relationship, I don't want to let go. People enter these relationships all the time. They know it's just going to destroy them, but got to hang on. <laughs> That's what I was doing, just holding on, holding on. But I remember our relationship continued to be a roller coaster. She loves me, she loves me not, you know. And so I could see the handwriting on the wall. We need a miracle. I thought about some. I thought, God can straighten out Shirley. <laughs> yes. It's like I had an epiphany. And I said, I said, okay, because my parents kept nagging me, Mark, you're living in sin. I didn't want to hear all that. You know, Mark, you need to move back home. If you want God in your relationship, if you want your relationship to be blessed, you've got to do it right. I said, okay. Finally, I decided. My father had an associate pastor, Dave Holton. And... Uh, he also, I guess he teamed up, you know, to bother me. And, uh, you know, Mark, you're living in sin. Yeah, that's what my parents said. <laughs> so it was like ganging up on me and my sin. But didn't Jesus tell the woman at the well, go get your husband? He wanted to deal with her sin she was living in, but she didn't feel condemned. And she was willing to make a change in her life. She was doing something millions do today, just living together. And so, at any rate, <clears throat> I said, Dave, come on over. I'm moving home. He said, all right, man. So he came with his pickup, and he backed up there in the apartment complex, and I started uh, loading things on, and then Shirley came home. She's like, what's going on? I'm moving out, baby. Moving out? Don't do that. And I remember distinctly. She had a beer can in one hand, a cigarette in the other, and she's crying, you know, don't leave, you know, don't move out. It's like, what? So I moved out, and uh, I remember when she was pleading with me not to move out, I remember looking at her and saying, we've got to have God in our relationship. I'm like, what? She must have thought I'd really lost it. I mean, she met me in a wild fox on the dance floor, and he's saying, we've got to have God in our relationship. I thought, well, he might give me a little upper hand in this relationship. So we started going to church. That was different. Me living at home, that was different. Can I, can I tell you something I believe with all my heart? If you keep doing the same thing, you'll get the same old. But if you're willing to make some decisive changes in your life that are painful, that you really don't want, your flesh says no way, but the Spirit says this is the only way, when you yield and you give in, some great things are going to happen in your life. And so we started going to church. Then, shortly after, we got a brochure of an evangelistic series being held in Springfield, Massachusetts by evangelist Mark Finley. Now, Mark Finley was a colleague of my father's in the Southern New England Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. In 1975, he had held an evangelistic series with my dad and the churches there, and my dad and he teaming up together in Harper, Connecticut, and my parents would confide in Mark Finley and Teeny Finley, his wife, and the evangelistic team. They called their team and their seminars Radiant Living Seminars. And it was fitting because they exuded warmth and love and care. And uh, my parents would confide in them and plead with Mark Finley and his wife and the team, could you please pray for our troubled teenager, Mark? So I became uh, uh, the individual that was uh, being prayed for. 
by the evangelistic team. Fast forward about a year and a half, two years later, here I am showing up. I told Shirley, we're going to go to these meetings. She was willing to go. And so we attended these evangelistic series in Springfield, Massachusetts at the Civic, Civic Center Auditorium. And as we came there, I just could feel that Mark Finley and his wife and the team were very happy and probably shocked that I was there. And so night after night, we attended. My heart was being touched. And I was hoping that this was rubbing off on Shirley. And I was hoping that God would straighten her out and help her to be faithful to me, committed to me. We could get married and we would follow God together and we would live happily ever after. But what happened was, I remember one night, Mark Finley made an altar call. And my heart told me, go. And also, in my heart was, i got to straighten out Shirley. So I said to her, Shirley, why don't we go forward? No, I'm not going to go forward. You go forward without me. I'm not going to go forward without you. If you're not going to go, I'm not going either. Been there, done that? One night, as we were exiting the auditorium, Mark Finley, as his custom was, was shaking hands with people as they were leaving. And upon shaking my hand, he said, Mark, can you stay afterwards? I'd like to talk to you. I said, sure. So after the people dispersed, we sat down at the edge of the stage, and he opened to a little book. Joel chapter 2, verse 25, and he said, Mark, here's a promise for you. I will restore to you all the years which the swarming locust hath eaten. He explained it this way. He said, Mark, the years you've given into sin, drugs, drink, and so forth, those years you've given into sin, you see, Mark Finley knew about the motorcycle accident, the drugs, the drinking. He knew that. And he was telling me, Mark, you give your heart to Jesus, he will restore you. Little did I ever dream that I would end up following in his footsteps to also enter into full-time public evangelism. At the time, I was, had a disheveled appearance, late-blooming hippie, looked like I was going nowhere, looked like I was just a hopeless case. But don't write somebody off who looks hopeless because my Bible says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15. And so... He shared that with me, and around that time, my brother Dana, I'm one of four boys, I'm number two, number three is Dana, and Dana had a dramatic conversion experience. We shared a bedroom, two twin beds, and he would get up early in the morning, I would go off to work, um, but he would usually get up early, sometimes before the sun would rise, and he would go off to a cornfield where he would spend time in prayer, Bible study, reading a book like Desire of Ages and different books, uh, uh, the, the Spirit of Prophecy in the Bible and so forth. And he would come back radiant. And I would make a, I, I would just have a query in my mind, circulating in my mind. How could he spend all those, that time, I mean, hours with God? I mean, like, what do you say? What do you do for hours? I couldn't connect because I didn't have a prayer life. I wasn't fully surrendered to the Lord. I was just focusing on God straightening her out and then we'll go there together. And so I remember going to my brother Dana because I could see that Shirley was still having misgivings. So I said, Dana, I really need some help. You know, I need help with my relationship with Shirley. What do you think I ought to do? You know, premarital counseling? Come on, Dana. <laughs> I looked up to him. I highly esteemed him. I respected him. And he said this, Mark, yeah, seek the Lord, yeah, seek the Lord, okay, that's it, <laughs> seek the Lord. So one night I remember asking him, Dana, can, can I go with you when you go out to pray? Sure, you can come with me. So we went out one night into the cornfield where he would spend hours in prayer and Bible study like Jesus. I'm going to agree, you want to be like Jesus, you might spend more than five minutes in prayer. And so we went out to the cornfield, we knelt down, and we bowed our heads, and he prayed. And while I was praying, I kind of... (laughs) 
And I'm thinking, you know, this is really not that spectacular. You know, I didn't see it. I didn't feel any strong emotion. And I'm thinking, okay, so that's his uh, cornfield experience there. All right. But I respected it, but I just didn't get any electrical shocks. And so around that time, I went to my dad because I saw my brother Dana. He was a coal porter, literature evangelist. He would knock on doors and he would share Christ with people and, and sell books related to the Bible. And he just was working for God. And Mark Finley and his evangelistic team working for God. And I immediately made a connection. If you want joy and peace in your life, you got to pray, you got to study, and you got to work for God. So I thought, okay, I got to work for God. All right, let's see. So I went to my dad. Dad, downstairs, East Hartford, Connecticut, in the pastor's parsonage, there in the house, there was the family room downstairs. And adjoining the family room was the bar. There was a cubby hole of a bar, and there was a bar counter, an open window there. And I leaned over the bar counter. You see, my dad had converted the bar into a little miniature claustrophobic pastor's study. And instead of dishing me out what I used to drink all the time, I was asking him for his godly parental pastoral counsel. And I was leaning over, and I said, hey, dad. You think there's anything I can do in the Lord's work, Dad? Well, my dad shared with me years later, Mark, it was like my heart was glass and it all shattered. Because it challenged my faith, Mark. You had a disheveled look. You had been a hippie. You had been into drugs and drinking. And, and you were just now coming out of all that. And you had problems with Shirley. And, and, and Mark, even my faith was struggling to reassure you. And I had a hard time. And... My dad was challenged to think how could he direct me in the Lord's work with a ninth grade education. But my Bible tells me something very, very interesting. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Verse 20. It's a quote from the book of Isaiah 42, and it's in reference to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Here is what's at the core of the ministry of Jesus, all right? Verse 20. A bruised reed, he, Jesus, will not break. A reed that is bruised, you say, well... Go ahead and break it because it's just as well as it's broken completely. It says he won't do that. A smoking flax, I mean, it's going out. May as well put it out. It's, it's over. He will not quench. What is this all about? There's hope for the hopeless. There's hope for the hopeless. That's what this scripture is saying. I was like that bruised reed. And so I went to my bedroom around that time frame. I went to my bedroom, and I knelt down because I didn't know what the future held, but I just knew I wanted more than being a shipper and receiver in a printing envelope company and with no future in sight. And I just felt utter turbulence in my life. I was searching. So I knelt down in my bedroom. Mind you, I didn't have a prayer life, but I knelt down in my bedroom, and I said a prayer like this. Dear Father in heaven, I want to work for you. Is there anything I can do in your work? It was like the devil piped up, I like, give me a break. <laughs> High school dropout, you know. But I just had a little ember in my heart that I wouldn't give up, that somehow, some way, maybe God could, could help me to do something for him. Do you know it says in Psalms 102, Psalms 102. Psalms 102, verse 17. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. I don't care how sinful you are. 
I don't care where you've been, how dark it is because maybe you've brought it upon yourself by foolish choices, but I'm here to tell you, he'll even regard the prayer of the destitute. And so around that time, I was wanting to work for God. Looked hopeless. Ring, 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 ring. Three days later, after praying that prayer, three days later, my dad gets a call from his brother, my uncle, Jerry Fox, who we had not heard from for 10 years. And he calls my dad, hey, Bruce, do you think that Mark, maybe Dana, you know, they could come out. Could Mark come out here? We're, we're working on a Christian project uh, associated with the, uh, with the Monterey Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're trying to get started a fine art gallery and a vegetarian r restaurant, kind of a unique combination, to try to reach out to the community with a health ministry. Uh, do you think Mark could come out here and work for God out here with us? My dad prayerfully, with a sense of solemnity, shared that with me. They knew, I knew, this is of God. Ah, uh, what about Shirley? So immediately, I, I kind of had mixed feelings, mixed emotions. Okay, work for God. Well, let's see, how is Shirley in all this in equation? Well, I could see the handwriting on the wall. It's over. <laughs> You know, go out there, new start, new dimension in your life, let go. The Bible says the flesh and the spirit are warring against each other so that you don't do the things that you would wish. You have to go through the struggle to let go of the flesh. What does that feel like? I'm about to tell you. And so I remember going to Shirley. Shirley? I got a call to work for God, and uh, I want us to do this together. You know, Shirley, I, I love you, and I, I want this to work out. Well, I, yeah, okay. I remember the soap opera. It's going the long nights of trying to, you know, well, you know, hope we can work this out. And I remember, I remember telling her, Shirley, I know God is for this relationship. Look how far we've come together. And there was a little voice saying, it's over. <laughs> Surely I know God wants this relationship. Have you ever tried to drown out that little voice? No, not you, just me. And so I could see the handwriting. So I said goodbye to my, my job. They had a farewell party. That was over. And I started getting my things together. And around this time, I would go to my brother Dana because I could see it doesn't look like Shirley was going to go with me. And Shirley was pretty much telling me the relationship is over. So I remember around this time going to my brother Dana. Dana, because my uncle did say, you know, if Dana would like to come too and work with us, we'd love to have him as well. So I would go to Dana. And I'd say, Dana, because I'm thinking in my mind, okay, no Shirley, no parents, no friends, no nothing. Alone? Dana, Dana, Dana's my buddy. Dana, 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 you want to go to California with me? Mark, I'll pray about it. Okay, well, I hope God knows what's best there. <laughs> and so uh, I would go back and forth. And what, what did God tell you? Well, I, I think I may go. Yeah, all right, let's go. And then the next day, I'm not so sure God wants me to go. So we went back and forth, back and forth. All the while, I'm very consistent in my message to my brother. Dana, let's go work for God together. Dana, you've, you've helped me so much. Dana, let's go. And, and I, w I had both things going on. I wasn't fully surrendered to the Lord. I was focusing, try to change Shirley, and try to get my brother to go to California with me. That was very hard to do at once. And so the, on the eve of our departure, because my brother finally said, oh, I, I think I'll go. Oh, this is good enough for me. <laughs> we got his stuff in the car. And, and uh, my dad said, Mark, let's go for a walk. And so we went on a, on, on a walk around our quarter-mile block there in East Hartford, Connecticut, in the residential area. And uh, my dad, underneath the starlit sky, having one of these unforgettable father-son chats, my dad said to me, Mark, you're going to look back at this as being the turning point 
in your life. My dad's words were prophetic and dramatically fulfilled. The next morning, Dana was having misgivings. Long story short, somehow we managed to get him in the car. My parents snapped a couple pictures and off we went. Down the rambling, down the highway. I think, at least he's in the car. We're going together. I've already said goodbye to Shirley. Got this broken heart, but we're going to California. Okay, my brother Dana's going to help me. You know, he's prayed for me. He's going to help me get through this emotional pain. He's my, he's my brother. Oh, he, he's my brother. Have no other gods before me. Not even a brother. Because our God is a jealous God. And so we're rambling down the highway. Mark, I think you should pull over because I noticed my brother was feeling trouble. Mark, I think you should pull over. Why? What's the matter? No, pull over. All right, all right. And we pulled over. And he said, Mark, I think we need to pray. Yeah, we need to pray for a sign from God. Yeah, because I think God wants you to take me back and for you to go alone to California. Okay. So he prayed, Lord, give us a sign. If you want Mark to take me back home and for him to go on alone, please guide us. And after he prayed, amen, I'm thinking I am ready to interpret any sign in my favor that ain't turning back for nobody. <laughs> No sign. Whew, that was a close call. So we're driving along. Mark, pull over to the side of the road. Oh, man, we got to do this again. I'm thinking, can't we pray when we get to California? <laughs> From Connecticut to California is a long stretch, a couple thousand miles, and I wasn't going to go alone. And so I was going to go serve God my way. Had it all planned out. Have you ever... You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 16, verse 9, a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And boy, when the Lord moves in to make some adjustments to your plan, that's where the flesh and the spirit have a little collision course. Because his ways are higher than our ways, Isaiah 55. Now watch this. So we finally made it to York, Pennsylvania, where from East Tarpon, Connecticut to York, Pennsylvania, and that was on a Friday night. And we stayed there with some Christian friends of the family. My father used to pastor there. And we stayed there. They also observed the Seventh-day Sabbath. And so we stayed there. And almost that whole Sabbath, my brother Dana wanted to be alone in prayer. Because I could tell he felt God wanted me to turn, turn, take him back and me to go alone. So Sunday morning came. Mark, I would like to drive. He said, okay, here are the keys. So he got in my satellite convertible. He put on his sunglasses, and I thought, if this will pacify him, no problem. Get to California. And so he started driving down the road, traveling down the road, and I noticed that he was not slowing down for our exit to California. He, I realized what he was doing in an instant, he was going to drive me back to, Cal to Connecticut. And so I said, Dana, get the exit. And he pulled one of those maneuvers, you know, you miss the exit, but you get it anyway. And so he pulled over, I said, pull over to the side of the road. You're not driving anymore. Now it was huffy. Big brother. I had more muscles then than I do now. But at any rate, <laughs> and so pulled off to the side of the road. And I said, you're not driving anymore. And so we switched places. He had turned the car off. And he was shaking, and I was shaking. He said, Mark, can we pray again? I said, sure. I thought, yeah, we need, need to pray this time. So we prayed the same prayer, like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Have you ever felt like sometimes you're praying the same old prayer? It's all right. Just don't give up praying. When the Bible says praying always, sometimes it means your prayers may seem like a broken record. Don't, don't miss this point. Pray your way through to your breakthrough. And so after he prayed uh, for a sign, whew, finally, let's get going. Click, 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 click. I looked at my brother and he had a smile. <laughs> I was thinking, that made me mad. And so I got out of the car, slammed the door, 
pop my hood, and they're like, what is wrong with this stupid car? So I'm looking at the engine, and I'm, I'm playing around with the bat oh, battery. Oh. You know, so I flagged down a car. They gave me a jump, went to the nearby gas station, and they told me, uh, your battery, sir, has a dead cell. <laughs> dead cell? That's a new battery. That's a brand new battery. Sir, it has a dead cell. You're going to have to get another one. So I pulled out of my pocket and said, all right, give me another one. And I gave him my parents' credit card. <laughs> my parents thought, whatever it takes, get them to California. <laughs> and so slap that new battery in there, slam the hood, and I've got a smile now. And my brother's very peripheral because he thought, what happened? <laughs> So I started rambling down the highway. I said, Dana, don't worry, man. You're going to serve God together. going to have a great time. I was not fully surrendered yet. I was scared to let go. Why don't we let go? Because we're afraid to. And so we're traveling along. Mark, could you get this exit here? Take this exit here. So, what do you want to do? No, let's get something to eat. All right, but here, here's the Howard Johnson's. We pulled in front of Howard Johnson's. He said, uh, Mark, as we pulled in the parking lot there, he said, uh, Mark, could you go in and order us a grilled cheese and tomato, French fries, you know, vegetarian delight. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I'll be in in about 10 minutes, Mark. Wondered what he had up his religious sleeve, but at any rate, I said, all right, that's cool, that's cool, all right. So I went in, ordered the, ordered the food, and about 10 minutes later, he comes to the table and drops the bombshell. Mom and Dad want us to call him in 10 minutes. Oh, man, why did you need to get them involved? Sure enough, on the phone, on the, remember the days of the payphone, payphone, or like, Mark, if he wants to come home, you got you to gotta get in the car, and you got to bring him all the way back here and go on alone. There is no way I'm going to do that. We are already here in southern Pennsylvania. I am not turning around. All of a sudden, my, my brother took off. Mom, Dad, look, Dana took off. I don't know what his problem is, but I got to go, all right? Mark, calm down, stay overnight there, and when we're refreshed and calm, we'll talk about this in the morning. I'm not going to do it. Goodbye, Mom and Dad. Left them hanging, and I thought, my brother is running away from me. And so I ran out the, the Howard Johnson's, and I'm like, where is he? I scanned the horizon. I didn't see it. And I thought, maybe he went around this side. So I walked around, and he's there hiding on the other side of the hotel from his crazy brother. And so I saw him. And he looked at me, and I looked at him. And our eyes locked in each other. And I saw a look of love. And he said to me, Mark, I don't want to hurt you. I love you. I just want to do what God wants me to do. Proverbs 15, verse 1, soft answer turns away wrath. And it did temporarily until the devil said, alone? No, no way. Come on, Dana, let's go. Let's go. Let's get in the car. Come on, we got to get going. And so he got in the car. He's wanting to get out of the car. And it was muscle against muscle. He was wanting to get out of the car. I was holding onto the car like, would you please get it together? We both agreed it's time to pray again. And after, pray the same old, same old prayer. Dana, I'll take you home. Did I just say that? I literally felt like, did those words just come out of me? I started to feel something down here that I never felt before in my life. And I thought, I'll take you back home. I felt it a little bit more. I'm like, what is that? I started up the car, took off, got on the highway, and I said, Dana, I'm sorry. He eased back into his passenger seat, and he said, Mark, I forgive you. I'm really sorry. And he started rummaging through maps. He was my navigator in more ways than one. He was rummaging through the maps. He pulls the map up. Hey, Mark, take this exit. Whoa, whoa, where are we going? Mark, take this. Okay, take a right. Mark, I said, what's up? What's up? He says, Mark, I think, I, I think, you may not have to take me all the way back home. And he led me to an apparently run-down Amtrak train station that was still in service. And he said, Mark, let's pray that I can get a train here. 
and that will have enough time to, to, to get all my belongings together and get a ticket, and I can go on my way, you can go on your way. I said, okay. That day, we were broken down for two hours. The train was coming in two hours. God always has perfect timing. The train was coming. My brother was leaving, holding everything back, trying to have some measure of composure. We got my brother's, an abbreviated version of his, of his belongings together. And he got a couple of suitcases, and he's sta there standing on the deck, and the train comes. And I said, Dana, I love you so much. I am going to miss you so much. I'm going to miss you too, Mark. We can keep in touch. And as he boarded that train, I said, Dane, I really, I really do love you, and I'm really going to miss you. Mark, we'll keep in touch. I love you, too. I'm going to miss you, too. When the doors closed, you know, trying to get one last look, and then I disappeared, and I thought, well, can I see him in another window? Or... And the train headed down the tracks, and the snow was falling in that November night. And I watched the train pass into the horizon. I looked at my car and holding it back, got in my lonely car, and I bowed my head and I cried the tears of a lifetime. And I felt a peace that passeth understanding, something I'd never felt in my whole life. And I said, oh, dear Father in heaven, please be with me. Please be with me on this trip. I need you. Forgive me for my sins. I accept you, Jesus. Be with me. And it was as if Jesus sat down next to me and assured me, I'll be your traveling companion. And then as I begin to travel down the highway, for three days alone, checking into hotel to hotel, last night's last thoughts in the evening of Jesus, first thoughts in the morning, Jesus, talking to Jesus alone for three days, I finally was getting the message, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, Proverbs 18, 24. By the time... I arrived in California after three days of Christian music and preaching by cassette by E.E. E. Cleveland about Christ our righteousness. By the time I arrived in California, I was so full of the Holy Ghost, nobody had to tell me to witness. I said, Lord, give me somebody to talk to. Let me tell them that I have found Jesus, and Jesus saves the chief of sinners. Tears would trickle down my face, and you know, when I lived there in Carmel Valley, California, the Lord impressed me to follow the example of my brother Dana. I would get up before it was light out, and I would get up while it was still dark, put my coat on, and I said, Lord, where do you want me to take some time alone with you? And I found a place out in the woods amidst the beautiful mountains there, the, the peaceful mountains of Carmel Valley, California. And I would go there and do exactly what my brother Dana had modeled, taking hours with God in prayer and Bible study. And then on Sabbath afternoon after church, I would take the whole afternoon, many afternoons, the whole afternoon and going into the evening walking. There was a park nearby and I would go walk and talk with God and kneel down somewhere and I would pray and I would study and I would read the book Desire of Ages on the life of Jesus. Tears trickling down my face. I had found Jesus for myself. Do you know him today? Do you know that he loves you? Do you know that he is your best friend? You need to yield to the Spirit. Jesus will help to keep your flesh in check because that's the only way the peace can flow. I wonder, do you want that today? Do you want Jesus more than ever before to be your traveling companion? If you do, he's here. 
He's reaching out and he says, be with me and be at rest. Be with me. If this is your desire, I invite you to stand. No turning back. We've come this far. No turning back. There may be some. There may be some. When you came here today, you came with a desire to follow God. But like me, you hadn't made a full surrender, but you want to. I invite you to come to the front. This is your day. This is your time. Whether it's one person, two persons, if you're just honest, your loving Savior's here. And you say, Mark, I came in here today wanting to follow God, but if I'm really honest, I, I hadn't fully surrendered. Everybody in, be in prayer because I think about what Jesus did just for me on that night. This is your time. If there's someone here, you want to make that full surrender, fully and completely, God bless you. Full surrender. You came in here, you were wanting to follow God. But if you're honest, you know you hadn't made a full surrender. This is your day. This is your day. This is your hour. This is your moment. God bless you. God bless you. Everybody be praying. Jesus would have died just for you. Any young people, you came in here with a desire to follow God, maybe even work for God. But like me, you haven't made that full surrender, but you want to now. Are there any young people? You, maybe you know about Jesus but you have not surrendered fully to Jesus to have him rule anyone. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward with the others who've come forward and say, this is my hour, Jesus. Full surrender. God bless you. Let me tell you something. Some of you are hooked on some addiction, whatever it is. In this moment, you can break away from it all forever and ever, forever free. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward? There may be some here. You say, Pastor Fox, I would like to be baptized soon. There might be young people here who'd like to say, I would like to be baptized soon. Maybe after I've received some Bible studies, but I'd like to be baptized soon. I invite you to come forward. Or like me, You'd like to be rebaptized. Reconversion, rebaptism. If you would like to be baptized or rebaptized, I invite you. This is your moment. This is your hour. Or maybe there's some here today you'd like to say, well, Mark, I've been baptized before or, or, or rebaptized, but I'd like to become part of God's remnant church by profession of faith. You come forward to now if you'd like to make that decision now. Whatever decision about joining God's remnant church, baptism, rebaptism, or to make that full surrender and struggle. You come now and we're going to pray. I'll just give a moment with everybody praying, every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's pray. Would you take hand of the, hold of the hand next to you and let's pray the prayer of agreement. Please, everyone, repeat after me. And I'm going to invite more of you to come forward. Baptism, rebaptism, profession of faith, breakthrough in some struggle. Now is your moment. If you would like to come forward, you just come forward. Everyone repeat after me if it's from your heart. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. I am a sinner. Save me by your grace. Forgive my sin. Create in me a clean heart. Help me to take time with you. In Bible study and prayer, faithfully every day, 
Help me to be your witness. Help me to be a kind, loving Christian. I surrender all to you, Jesus. Every part of me, my money, my lifestyle, the words I speak, the thoughts I think, my job, my family, my car, it's all yours. Help me to be ready and my family when you come. In Jesus' name, amen.